So please turn in your Bibles to the book of Genesis, Genesis at chapter 12. And we read uh, three verses from the beginning, Genesis chapter 12. And the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Particularly those words, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now turn to the book of Galatians, chapter 3. Galatians in the New Testament and chapter 3. Verse 8, or verse 7. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying... In thee shall all nations be blessed. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. We continue this morning with our study on the sacraments and particularly the sacrament of baptism. A few weeks ago we examined the meaning of baptism and then last time we moved on to consider the subjects of baptism or put another way, who should be baptized? We noted that there is obvious disagreement on this point in the church of the Lord Jesus, but we defined what that disagreement really is. It's not that Baptists baptize adults and we only baptize children. We baptize adults as well, those who are outside the church who make profession of the Lord Jesus Christ. We baptize them and admit them into the church. The question is rather how we view and what we do with their children, the children of believers. It is our contention, according to the word of God, that the children of believers should be baptized. Now, the reason for this we've stated to be that God included children in the church in the Old Testament and applied the sign of the covenant to them. And we see continuity in that from the Old Testament into the New Testament. And so we've been fleshing that out. Last time we were particularly looking at the unity of the covenant of grace. And we said that there are different covenants that are spoken of in the Bible. The covenants that God made with Abraham, with Noah, with David. The new covenant that he speaks of likewise and reveals to us in the New Testament. But all of those covenants are the same in substance and essence. They've got different particulars, like he promises Abraham the land of Canaan. They've got different particulars. But they're the same in substance and essence. But they're being administered differently at different points in history. Now, how did we establish that? Four ways. First of all, we noted all these covenants have the same parties, God and man, or God and sinners. Then all of these covenants have the same essential promise, I will be your God and you will be my people. All these covenants have the same mediator, Jesus Christ. Because how can God be the God of any sinner outside of Jesus Christ? And all of these covenants have the same condition, faith in the one and only mediator, Jesus Christ. So from Genesis to Revelation, you have this one covenant of grace. This morning we want to take that a step further. Because that one covenant of grace is the means through which the Lord Jehovah is the God of sinners that he calls out of this world in time. Now understand that. This covenant of grace is the way that God calls sinners out of the world unto himself in time. At the heart of it, there's reconciliation in Christ. But if that is the case, 
There is one church and there is one gospel. Now, the moment that we say that, it ought to say to you that this is related to baptism. Why? Well, if baptism is a sign of the gospel, if baptism is a seal of the one covenant of grace, and if baptism is the rite of initiation into the one church, then the unity of the covenant of grace, the unity of the church of Christ, and the unity of the gospel of God all pour into <laughs> our understanding of who should be baptized. So let's open that up this morning, two main points. There is one church of God in all ages, and there is one gospel of God in all ages. There is one church of God in all ages. Now we assert that against dispensationalism. You might not know it by its name, but I guarantee you, you've met it, and maybe in the past, you thoroughly believed it. It's rampant in these parts. Dispensationalism is the view which teaches that the church is totally distinct from Old Testament Israel. When Christ came into the world to Israel, they rejected him and the kingdom. The kingdom, therefore, was postponed while the gospel went to the Gentiles and God established his church. But the church is like a parenthesis. Children, you've written a sentence or you've seen a sentence and there's a main thought and then in the middle of it there's something in brackets. It's like an afterthought. Or maybe it's not essential to the flow of the sentence. You put it in brackets. That's a parenthesis. Well, to dispensationalism, the church and the church age is somewhat of a parenthesis until God takes up his promises and purposes toward Israel again when Jesus comes and establishes an earthly kingdom which they relate to the millennium. Now, to some in this camp, the church was not even known in the Old Testament or prophesied. All of the promises in the Old Testament were to Israel. Well, that's classical dispensationalism. There are other more diluted forms of it, but the best of them so separate the New Testament from the Old Testament that they fail to see the church growing out of the Old Testament and into the New. But rather, they view that the church begins, essentially begins, in the New Testament on the day of Pentecost. Well, against that, we are contending that the church is essentially one in all ages. And I want to demonstrate that to you this morning, biblically. First of all, let's consider the word church. The word church. Now, it's an English word. It does have its root in Greeks, in Greek kuriakos, meaning uh, of the Lord or the Lord's possession. But it's an English word that translates the Greek word ecclesia. Now we still use forms of that word today with respect to the church. You might hear ecclesiology being spoken of. That's that uh, section of theology where we look at the doctrine of the church. Or you will hear of ecclesiastical courts or ecclesiastical discipline. Church courts, church discipline. Well, the word ecclesia is, formed, is found about 144 times in the New Testament. It comes from two Greek words, ek and kalio, which together mean called out. So the ecclesia or the church is those that God has called out. Now, it's also fair to say that in the New Testament, it is used in a general sense of any assembly and any Gathering. If you turn to Acts chapter 19, you'll find an example of that in verse 32. Acts chapter 19 and verse 32. There's a gathering in Ephesus. Verse 32, some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused. The word is ecclesia. The assembly was confused and the more part confused knew not wherefore 
they were come together. So it can be used generally of an assembly or gathering of people. But when it's used religiously, it always means an assembly of the people of God. And when you probe that a little bit further in the New Testament, you'll see that it has various nuanced applications, different ways that the word is applied. Always an assembly of the people of God to some effect. But for example, in Colossians 4 verse 15, it is a church or gathering in a house. Then in Acts chapter 11 verse 22, it is a church or gathering in a city like the city of Jerusalem. And there may not have only been one congregation there, but maybe a number of congregations, but yet it's also called the church. If you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and look there at verse 28, you'll see it used of a local congregation, but also beyond that, uh, the church of God that is in the earth. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 28, and God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Now he's writing to a local congregation, but that congregation does not have its own apostle. So he's speaking more broadly here of the church in the earth. God hath set some in the church, apostles, prophets, teachers, and so on. But then turn a few pages further ahead to the book of Ephesians and look at chapter 5, verse 22, where the church is now spoken of as the church in heaven and in earth, the whole number of the elect. <clears throat> Ephesians 5 Verse 25, husbands, love your wives even as Christ also hath loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. So that takes us to the last day and Christ presenting his perfected church to the world and to the Father. So you've got this one term, ecclesia. It means called out or an assembly of the Lord. And it has these various uses and applications in the Bible. Well, that brings us to a second thing about this church. The visible and the invisible church. Now, sometimes people say, well, that's a construction of theologians. That's a name that they've given to something that's not in the Bible. But it is indeed in the Bible. And those two texts that we've just focused on in 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians chapter 5 show us the distinction. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul is writing of the church as an institution to whom God gives gifts. A church that you can locate, a church that you can see with your eye, a church that is right before you here in Mebon this morning. It gathers in local congregations. It has members. The members are all members of one body. It has ordinances of worship, like the preaching of the word of God, the sacraments of baptism, and the Lord's Supper. And it has governments, likewise. Elders, deacons, pastors, teachers. We call that the visible church. And the visible church is made up in the earth of all those who profess the true religion together with their children. But then there's Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25. And that's a real body, but it is not discernible to us with our eye now. No, indeed, it will not be visible to perfection to us until that day of, of the Lord when he presents it unto his Father. And so we call that aspect of the church the invisible church. And by it we mean the whole number of the elect, both in heaven and in earth. They are not on the earth all at the same time. Nor do we know at any time on the earth who the elect actually are. We don't definitively know that. 
So do you see the distinction? There's the visible church. It's an institution. It gathers in local congregations. It has members and worship and government. And then we have the invisible church, the whole number of the elect. Now these aren't distinct entities as if they have no relationship one to another. Rather, they are intimately related. On earth, the invisible church is within the visible church. Children, maybe you remember last week I used the illustration of two circles and I, I tried to do it quite clumsily with my fingers. Maybe you didn't, you didn't understand what I was saying. But we said the covenant of grace as it's administered in the world is the big circle. And in that we have the elect chosen in Christ in the covenant of redemption. <coughs> and that was a smaller circle within the bigger circle. Now we're saying exactly the same thing with regard to the church. The visible church is the covenant people of God. God is administering his covenant of grace in the bigger circle. The invisible church, however, is the smaller circle within it. <coughs> the whole number of elect that God has given to Christ in the eternal covenant of redemption. Now, this is not something new to the New Testament. This was always the case. There was Israel, and then there was Israel. Isn't that right? Not all Israel were Israel. They were in one sense, but not in the other. And so God was repeatedly coming to them and saying, you need to have the root of the matter in you. You need to be circumcised in heart. It's the same idea. There's a bigger circle and a smaller circle. So we have the visible and the invisible church. Very well. When did the church start? When did the church start? Well, to the dispensational, the church began on the day of Pentecost. And sometimes you might fall into a similar idea. You know, we, we talk about the early church, and by that we tend to mean the, the, the church of the first three centuries after Christ. And that's okay, we can talk about the early church in that way, so long as we understand it's the early church with respect to its New Testament form. Because when we look at the Scripture, a better analysis and conclusion would be to say this, Adam was in the church. Adam was in the church. Why? Well, if the word ecclesia means the assembly of the people of God, those who are called out from the world unto God in covenant. And if the invisible church is the whole number of the elect chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, Adam was in the church. He was never in Israel, however. He was never in Israel, nor was Noah, nor was Shem. They were never in Israel but they were in the church. And when that great day of the Lord comes and Christ presents his church unto the Father, redeemed Adam and the redeemed patriarchs will be there in that body. Adam was in the church. But then secondly, Israel was the church. Israel was the church. We read in Genesis chapter 12 this morning, what happens there? God calls Abraham from Ur of the Chaldees unto himself and says, you're going to the land that I'm going to show you. And listen carefully, children. God does what? God calls Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. Do you remember what Ecclesia means? Called out. <coughs> Called out. God calls Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees and he establishes his covenant with him. And he says, you are going to be my people and I will be your God. He reiterates that covenant to Isaac and to Jacob. Jacob grows in a family, into a family and that family goes down to Egypt. And while there, they multiply into a nation. While they're suffering the bondage of the Egyptian, God remembers his covenant. 
So he looks back and he remembers the oath to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. And he now deals with Israel in Egypt upon the basis of that oath. And he redeems them from Egypt. And then he reaffirms the covenant at Mount Sinai administered now by Moses under the law. There's a connection, you see. These aren't disconnected things. The one is building upon the other. He gives his law to Israel. He gives them various names like my people, my flock. But if you turn to Deuteronomy chapter 23, you'll see that he calls them something very particular there. Now I grant to you that some of the things here are shocking to us, and I don't want to get into them in particular. It's just one thing that I want to focus your attention in, and it is the title that God uses of Israel. He that is wounded in the stones, or he, or hath his privy member cut off, shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Note it. A bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to his tenth generation shall he not enter into the congregation of the Lord. An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. I challenge you to go home and type in congregation into one of those online Bible word searches and just see how many times it comes up in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. There are a variety of Hebrew words used, but this word is the word kahal. Translated in the Septuagint, the Greek New Testament, by ecclesia. Deuteronomy chapter 23, Israel are the ecclesia of the Lord. The ecclesia of the Lord. You'll find it in a different form. They are the congregation of Israel. They are the ecclesia of Israel. Now think about that. All those New Testament churches that Paul writes to and says, Paul to the church that is in Ephesus, to the church that is in Corinth, the only version of the Old Testament that they have is the Septuagint. They're Greek speakers. They're not naturally Hebrew speakers. And they would go to Deuteronomy chapter 3 and see the Ecclesia of the Lord, the Ecclesia of Israel. You would hope they'd, they'd make a connection, <laughs> wouldn't you? Israel were the congregation of the Lord, called out from the world unto God in time. So you have evidence from the Old Testament that the church started before the New Testament period. But let's move to the New Testament. And you find evidence of it there as well. Turn to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. And look with me there at verse 17. Now interestingly, dispensationalists argue that this gospel was for the Jew. And yet it's the only gospel that Jesus actually speaks of the church under this term, Ecclesia. <coughs> Matthew chapter 18, you'll find it in chapter 16 as well. But Matthew chapter 18 and verse 17, And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. I think I should point out to you that the church has not started at this point if the church only started at Pentecost. This is before Pentecost. And yet he speaks to his disciples as though they understand what he means when he says Ecclesia. Why is that? Because the synagogue was referred to in the same way. The synagogue was the gathering, that's another word, like Ecclesia, the gathering, the congregation of the Lord. Those who would come together. So there was an established practice, even in Jesus' day, that you took a matter to the church, and the church settled the matter by its discipline. And that is going to continue when Jesus builds his church into the New Testament period. You say, well, I hear that, but it doesn't really prove that that the, that the church was before the day of Pentecost. Okay, let's turn to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. 
And look at verse 38, where Peter is defending himself before the Sanhedrin, and the whole thrust of his message is continuity. We do not believe anything new. We have not separated or become something different than what we were before. We are the children of Abraham, and the promises of Abraham have come to pass. And he focuses upon Israel in the wilderness. Acts chapter 7, verse 38. This is he, Moses, that was in the church in the wilderness. This is he who was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. Stephen says, Moses was in the ecclesia. Moses was in the church in the wilderness. So mark that. And then turn to Romans chapter 11. Did Paul believe that Israel was something distinct from the church? Did, did Paul teach that the New Testament church was a kind of parenthesis until God uh, continued with this distinct group of people called Israel? Well, the answer to that question is no. The gospel has come. It's to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But the Jew has not believed the gospel. Why is this, Paul? Why has God cast off his people? And Paul says, well, actually, he hasn't. Not totally. You're thinking like Elijah did when he thought he was the only one left in Israel. And God said, there are 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. You're thinking like that. Understand that even then... God had a remnant in Israel who believed the gospel. All of the apostles were originally Jews. So he hasn't cast them off totally, nor has he cast them off finally. They're going to be brought in again. Now, it's very interesting the way he teaches this. Children, you'll be able to follow it. You've seen a tree before, haven't you? Is a tree one thing or two things? It's one thing, isn't it? Now, it has many branches, but it's one tree, isn't it? It's got one trunk, and out of that all of the branches grow. Well, Paul says in the Old Testament, Israel was the olive tree. And something has happened. In the New Testament, God has cut off most of the natural branches. And then he's grafted in unnatural branches, Gentiles, into the same olive tree. He didn't say God took a hatchet and chopped the tree down and planted a new tree. That's dispensational theology. He said there's one tree, the natural branches were cut off, the Gentile branches are grafted in, and guess what? In the future, the natural branches are going to be grafted in again. Into what? Listen, verse 24. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert graft contrary to nature into the good olive tree, how much more shall these which be the natural branches be graft into their own olive tree? Get it. Jew and Gentile together in one body, the tree that is growing through history, the covenant people of God... And they are one. That's what I'm saying to you this morning. The church is one from the Old Testament into the New Testament. Israel was the church. And the church today has not replaced Israel. Nor is it a parenthesis in the unfolding of God's purpose of salvation. It is a continuation. It's a continuation of the one covenant people of God now extended to the nations. And the Jews are going to be brought back into the same olive tree, not to be something different, but to be brought back into the one church of God. Now this bears on what we're going to consider next week and the weeks ahead. Because if the church is one in all ages, who were included as members of the church in the Old Testament. Who decided who should be included as members in that church? 
And who received the sign of church membership? But for now, let me kneel down this point. There is one Bible. There is one covenant of grace. There is one church and people of God from the Garden of Eden to the consummation of all things in glory. There is one church of God in all ages. Now what we want to do is to proceed to consider how God redeemed that one people from all ages. And the answer to that question is simple. There's one gospel. One gospel. One church of God in all ages. And one gospel of God in all ages. Well, we've been stating this already and demonstrating it in a number of ways. But I want to make it more clear for you this morning. That sinners in all ages were saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's consider, first of all, that Christ is proclaimed in the Old Testament as the promised seed. Christ is proclaimed in the Old Testament as the promised seed. Turn to Genesis chapter 3 and look there at verse 15. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Adam and Eve have just fallen into sin and God comes to speak to the serpent and as he curses the serpent we overhear a message of salvation and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel so the serpent has just come in and he has wrought havoc upon humanity by tempting our first parents to disobey God. The works of the devil are now manifest. Man has been destroyed in sin. <clears throat> but a man will arise who will crush the head of the serpent, the implication being overthrow him and destroy all of his works and give to a people victory over him. This is going to be done in the seed of the woman. Now it's a very basic promise. But remember the illustration last week, if I was to draw you a rough outline of a man and say to you, what does it look like? You would say, it looks like a man. And then we would add detail and shade and color and by the end of it, the portrait would be there in, in all of its finished form. Well, here's the outline. The seed of the woman is going to bruise the head of the serpent. And Adam and, and, and Eve believed that promise as the gospel. How do we know that? Because in verse 30, Adam turns to his wife and he calls her Eve. From the Hebrew word chava, which means life. Life. Or we might say the mother of all living. Note it. The seed of the woman is going to be the one in whom you get victory. And Adam says, very well, there's the woman. What am I going to call her? Life. This is our hope. Then in verse 21, God takes animal skins. The animals had to die. And he clothes our first parents in the animal skins because their fig leaves wouldn't do. So what have you got in Genesis chapter 3? You've got promise of life through a seed of the woman and you've got a picture of substitutionary death and sacrifice. I don't need to tell you, I trust this morning, that those two things are at the very heart of the gospel of Christ. And when we come into the New Testament, what are we told? But in the fullness of time, or when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. What's the next clause? And why is it there? Made of a woman. Why is that there? Why does he not just say, he sent his son into the world and, and his son died upon a cross? Because you see, he's taking up the theme that was revealed in the Old Testament, that salvation would come through the seed of the woman. Then you come to the promise reiterated to Noah. From Adam to Noah, there's sin, and God sends a flood to judge the world. 
But judgment is not the solution to the problem of our sin. God has promised victory in the seed of the woman. So he preserves the race in Noah. And when Noah steps out upon the new earth with his seed, God focuses attention upon the line of Shem. And he says, this is the line now that the seed is going to come from. A few chapters later, from the line of Shem, we meet Abraham. And God establishes his covenant with Abraham and again reiterates his promise concerning a seed. Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, he says, Abraham, in thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. But then he fleshes that out in chapter 22, verse 18. He says, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And you might be sitting there this morning wondering, what has this got to do with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, Paul explains it for us in Galatians chapter 3. And he says, when God made that promise unto Abraham, he did this. He preached the gospel unto Abraham. Paul's words, not mine. Not some theological imposition upon the text. Paul says, no, that promise of the seed in whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed was the gospel. And Abraham believed the promise of the gospel and was justified by faith. So Jesus could say of him, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and he was glad. Then we come to David, the seed of Adam, the seed of Shem, the seed of Abraham, the seed of David. After Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, God highlights Judah. He's going to come from Judah. A thousand years later, he chooses David and he says, I'm going to establish your kingdom forever and your seed is going to sit upon an everlasting throne and all the nations of the world are going to become subject to your son. I've quoted it many times. I make no apology for quoting it again this morning. Matthew 1 verse 1. The New Testament just picks up the story and says by implication, it's all about that seed. The book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And we might say, the son of Shem, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the seed of the woman who would bruise the head of the serpent. So that first promise in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, the promise of a seed was a seed in itself. And just like an acorn Everything that was in the mighty gospel oak tree that we now see was in that first seed promise of a child who would come and destroy the work of the devil. So the gospel is proclaimed through the promised seed. Secondly here, Christ was preached in types and shadows. Now, the book of Hebrews tells us this, that God appointed patterns of things in the heavens, which were figures of the true. So these are shadows that are, are pointing forward to substance. If you're walking along the road and the sun's at a certain angle in the sky, you'll see your shadow cast in front of you, won't, won't you? But if you're not there, is there going to be a shadow there? And you say, well, no. Because the shadow is telling you that there is a reality. Now, you can't see the eye color or anything in that shadow, but you can learn that there's something there. The Old Testament is giving us types and shadows. We can't go through them this morning in any great detail, but think of the Passover lamb. Take the lamb, apply the blood, and you'll have redemption. Think of the Levitical sacrifices where God institutes a whole ceremonial system of worship based upon substitutionary sacrifice, mm. saying to Israel, your problem is sin. The only answer to your problem is the death of another. 
and for 1,500 years, he places them under a schoolmaster, which is saying to them every day, Christ, Christ, Christ. A schoolmaster that leads them to Christ. Now, there was no efficacy in the blood of the lamb or the bull or the goat that was offered. But the efficacy was in the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, who was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So you've got Levitical sacrifices. Then you also have Messianic offices in the New Testament. You have prophets, you have priests, you have kings. The king and the priest, we know for sure, were they entered into their office by way of anointing, and therefore they were all little messiahs, anointed ones. Well, when you look at this in the Old Testament, you have prophets, and all of the prophets point to a greater prophet that's going to come and teach us God's will for salvation. Then you have the priesthood. Aaron is chosen by God from among men to serve men. And he's going to offer sacrifices and represent them before God. And then you have kings. First of all, a ruler like Moses, and then sporadic judges in the period of the judges, and then monarchy comes to the fore. And you have the kings after the line of David and Solomon. And things begin to take shape there as we wait for the son of David to come. They're all pointing forward. They're all anticipations of Christ, who when he is revealed, is the prophet who is greater than Moses. Never man speak like this man. He's the priest that is greater than Aaron, who by his one sacrifice for sin forever is able to save us to the uttermost. And he is the king that is greater than David, who indeed David calls Lord who is King of kings and Lord of lords. So we have Christ preached in the promised seed. We have Christ revealed in these types and shadows. And then we have Christ revealed in prophetic predictions. You should study them. They'll strengthen your faith. There are hundreds of them. But Jesus says, you'll find me in the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. So I just want to do that this morning. One from each. Deuteronomy 18 verse 15 The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren like unto me unto him shall ye hearken There's a prophet coming like Moses Well you check Acts chapter 3 Peter preaches and he says that's Jesus Jesus is come in fulfillment of that verse Then you have the Psalms Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Psalm 22, verse 1. Or go to verse 16. For dogs have compassed me about. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and feet. They parted my garments. They cast lots upon them. And it's all fulfilled at the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or turn, please, to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. The law, the writings, or the Psalms, and now the prophets. And is there anything clearer than this? Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he hath done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Of whom does the prophet speak? Well, a eunuch from Ethiopia asked that question in Acts chapter 8. And Philip turned to the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. 
the promised seed, types and shadows, countless prophetic predictions, <coughs> telling us that there is one church in all ages, redeemed unto God by one Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore there is one gospel of God in all ages. Three points of application as we close. First of all, this unity declares God's glory. This unity declares God's glory. There is one covenant of grace, one covenant people of God and church in all ages, one gospel, one saviour, and it all combines to the glory of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A God who does not save one way and when that didn't work tries another way. But a God who is sovereign and from eternity has appointed what he would accomplish. The glorification of himself in the life and the death and the resurrection of his son and our Lord Jesus Christ. Any scheme or idea that suggests that God saves sinners any other way, whether today or yesterday, than Jesus Christ is an affront to the sovereignty of God and is a blasphemy against the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus. You don't believe that there are different ways to God today, I trust. You'll tell me, John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but me. Our dispensational friends would tell you that that's true for today as well. But then they'll tell you it wasn't true for Adam. It wasn't true for Noah. It wasn't true for Moses under the law. Maybe it's fitting I use this term today. Because it was coined by a man who just died. Chronological multi-faith. We reject that too. Not just multi-faith today. We reject chronological multi-faith. Why? Because there's one God, there's one Savior, there's one covenant people of God and church in all ages. And any other proposed scheme of salvation is an affront to the sovereignty and the glory of God. This unity declares God's glory. Secondly, this unity poses a question to you. If there is one church of God in all ages, are you in it? Well, you say, yes, I'm here. I'm here in the church today. I'm a member of the church today. I've been baptized into membership of the church. Well, let's amen that. And that means that you're in the olive tree. It's a glorious privilege. But something you should note about that olive tree is that it had branches that could be cut off, didn't it? And the natural branches who were so privileged in the Old Testament were cut off because they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the middle of Romans chapter 11, God says to you and me that we therefore must fear because if God spared not the natural branches, why do you think he'll spare you for your unbelief? So my question goes further. When I ask you, are you in the church? I'm asking you before God, are you a true member? Of that church. And you'll say, seriously, Pastor, are you asking me in a sense, am I one of the elect? And I suppose I am. I'm asking you that question. But I'm not going to send you to try and pry into the secret decree of God in order that you might answer that question. Because this unity that we have spoken of this morning points you to the answer. The only way you can know your election is by responding to the one gospel by which every one of the elect of God has been saved, is being saved, and will be saved. <clears throat> 
So let's put the question to you again this morning. Are you a true member of the Church of Christ? What have you done with Jesus? The only way that you can know your election and I can know mine is by repenting of your sin and believing the gospel. You'll not find an answer to that question anywhere else but in responding to the gospel of Christ. What a challenge to you, therefore, an encouragement today. Because the Old Testament saints, with the light that they had, trusted in the promised Savior. So if Abraham could see Christ's day 2,000 years before he came, and he saw it and was glad... And if the Israelites could look through the sacrifices of their ceremonies and see the Lamb of God that would come to be slain for the sin of the world. What about you? The shadows have gone. And Jesus stands. And he says, come unto me, all ye that are, who, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He is the only mediator between God and man. He is the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. He is the only door by which you must enter in. And he is the one name under heaven given among men whereby you and I must be saved. And if you come to this Lord Jesus Christ this morning, you will sit in his eternal kingdom. You will be a member of the General Assembly and Church of the Firstborn whose names are written in heaven. And there you will sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. One of the united people of God from all ages, saved by the one Lord Jesus Christ. To the glory of God the Father. Get this. From the last two weeks of ministry, there is one Bible, there is one covenant of grace, there is one church, and there is one gospel by which you and I must be saved. Let's stand for prayer.